So um, going back to, I guess, early in the talk, um, Kristen asked a good question uh, about, you know, you talked about uh, Dunmore's proclamation and, and the yeah. British actions. And, and to what extent did that change the discussion about slavery in the sort of new United States, if at all? Um, or, you know, in the American colonies and then the, in, you know, the new United States? Yeah, I think that's a great, it's a great question and a really important one. You know, the truth is, is that the English proclamations for the most part did not, I don't think, radically changed how the American rebels were thinking about slavery because they were so infuriated <laughs> about the English passing those proclamations in the first place. One of my sort of favorite George Washington quotes that I use in class all the time is that George Washington, after Lord Dunmore passes his proclamation, calls Lord Dunmore the most dangerous man in America, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah. there is this like real concern about um, Dunmore's proclamation. I think actually Lord Dunmore's proclamation gets a little bit too much shine. I think the Phillipsburg proclamation is actually the one that really sort of delivers the death blow, right? Because um, the Phillipsburg proclamation, the Lord Dunmore's proclamation is really focused on men, right? So saying to enslaved men, look, if you run away and you come and join the British army, we'll let you take up arms, right? Against the people who have been enslaving you. And that's really appealing to the men, but the men then are the only ones running away. The Phillipsburg proclamation says anyone, man, woman, and child who's willing to run away and seek refuge with the British army, we will protect you, we will give you freedom, and we will give you employment. And so it's really the Phillipsburg proclamation that opens up the floodgates. Um, but I don't think those proclamations really change how the Americans feel about slavery because they feel like, look at what the English are doing to us, <laughs> right? Like, it's just another reason then to be mad um, mm -hmm. at the English and at the English crown. Um, I think really the thing that is causing the real crisis for, um, for the Americans is how do we really feel about liberty? Like, you know, do we really feel like these people who we're holding in bondage are humans? And if so, then what right did they have to liberty? And what right has God said that they have to freedom, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. I think it's actually more natural rights philosophy and the great awakening. You know, I think, I think, we t I think in contemporary society, we tend to downplay the significance of the religious component of this right, that we frame it around natural rights philosophy. And I think that was definitely important. But I think for a lot of people, both North and South, the real question was, how does God feel about this? <laughs> right? Like, does God feel like these people are humans who have a right to their freedom? And if so, am I going to burn in hell, <laughs> right, for this? And is God mad? Like, does God want them to have their freedom? You know, that's really what people in the 18th and 19th century you're thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I always tell my students that we really underestimate the, the impact of religion and the affection yeah. that people had for their states. I, yeah. I know that's not a problem in Texas, but in other yeah. places, <laughs> yeah. in other places it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, you know, a lot, you know, I've spent most of my career teaching either in the, either in the North or in the West. And it, that is a challenge because, you know, there is, um, it's at, the focus in education is so much on secular life, yeah. <laughs> you know, that um, it's hard to get students to understand like the significance, right? That um, religion and the question of how does God feel about this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that that would really have a significant impact on the choices that people are making. Um, and, and so a quick one, and then maybe a question that I think we can put out there and then maybe we can I think we'll get to in our discussion in the second half. Um, you mentioned the debate over the cotton gin and it just got yeah. people kind of interested because I think everyone teaches about that. Um, and I don't know how much, how immersed you are in that uh, debate, but, but can you just tell us the, the, the debate briefly and, and does anybody claim that African-Americans actually? Yeah. Invented that? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I will be honest, I'm not deeply immersed in the debate. Yeah. Um, but I do know that um, there have there are historians and scholars out there who have suggested that the cotton gin was actually developed by an enslaved African American okay. who was kind of actually trying to find a way to make their work easier, <laughs> right? And so invented this um, machine to help separate the cotton from um, you know, all the sticky goo, <laughs> you know, and all the, you know, things that are attached to it. And so that it was actually an enslaved person who invented the cotton gin and that Eli Whitney stole the idea and then eventually got the patent for it. Um, so that is sort of at the heart of the historical debate, you know, did Eli Whitney really invent the cotton gin or did Eli Whitney like steal the idea and get the patent for it? Um, okay. wow. and that wouldn't be the first time in U S history wow. that, you know, someone stole, you know, an invention from a black person and got the patent for it. That has happened a number of times. So it, you know, that would not be a shocking thing if that were true, but that's essentially what the historical debate is about okay. is who actually invented the thing itself. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That sounded pretty familiar. The, the pattern. <laughs> <You just> yeah. <laughs> 